Beautiful. The nations of my heart be found acceptable to you today as I share with your people what you have given for me for them today. Open our hearts to hear. Open our hearts to receive. Open our minds to comprehend the Spirit, to discern your heart and mind and intentions for us today. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Earlier this week, Lucy called my attention to a, a Facebook a Facebook uh, plea, if you will. A plea to all of God's people. I thought it was an honest effort to encourage us all, each and every one, to a time of prayer for our country. A call to intercede for our nation. A nation which finds itself in a time perhaps of upheaval, confusion, disappointment, and even desperation. Not unlike Israel, right after its release from exile and captivity, as we discussed in my musings for Wednesday night. You may recall as I draw a comparison to Israel who had just been released from its Babylonian exile and allowed to return to Jerusalem, only to find that things there were not much better uh, in their release than it was in their captivity. We listen to the psalmist express some concerns along with a sentiment of hope for the future in Psalm 85. My friend and his plea on Facebook seemed a little undone, a bit disappointed and perhaps a lot anxious, and yet his plea was an echoing of God's steadfast love and faithfulness of the past in our hope for his preferred future. His plea was in the form of an often quoted scripture in times like these, times when it seems as if our country has completely abandoned God and that God has turned away from us. I can remember a number of times when these words from Second Chronicles echoed across the land throughout the chambers of our formal sanctuaries and our home churches. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. What a powerful statement from God. What a powerful expression of God's faithfulness and God's hope for us. I think sometimes we forget, however, that this is a conditional statement, amen? An if-then statement. What was going on in the life of God's people that would inspire such words from God? Who was God speaking to and why? As we answer these questions, perhaps we can understand why my friend was so adamant about everyone hearing his plea and passing it on to everyone else. The scripture in question today comes to us from 2 Chronicles, chapter 7 and verse 14. It is quoted quite often when things don't seem to be going our way. Things had not been going well for Israel. They had been in exile. They had been in captivity. Think about if someone came to your door of a night and knocked on the door and grabbed hold of you and your loved ones and put you in a boxcar or something or in a, in a, in a, in a truck and trailer and dragged you off to some parts unknown. That's exile. That's where Israel had been for, for a couple of generations. Away from home. 
that relationship was getting serious. And the young man spoke to her and said, before we go any farther with our relationship, you need to know something. I never intend to leave Moore, Moore County. Home is important. Israel had been taken out of its home place, Jerusalem, and carried off to Babylon in captivity, in exile. And now they had returned only to find that things were not much better there than what they had left. Why would God do such a thing to God's people? That is the question this morning, and that is the point of it all this morning. Over time, you see, Israel had rejected God. Israel had systematically made other things their God, whether in the form of actual idols or simply fo focusing more on the cares of the world at that time than on the precepts of God. They had turned their eyes away from God. Easily you can see that not very much has changed even today. And so Chronicles is a history book, if you will, chronicling certain historical elements of the life of Israel leading up to and after the exile. King Solomon, King David's son, is king and in charge and in, in, in the process of rebuilding the temple. You know, sometimes we take scripture out of context. I think we like to do that. I think often is not this scripture that we're quoting from 2 Chronicles 7.14 can, can be taken out of context. I want to bring it back into context for you this morning and share with you a little bit of what's going on and why God chose to share these words with Solomon. Earlier in chapter 6, Solomon is interceding for the people of God as he's dedicating the temple. He starts off dedicating the temple and then he begins interceding on behalf of the people. Who had what? Who had turned their face from God. Who had rejected God and had just been released from exile because of it. Here we find Solomon actually doing the praying in chapter 6, and God answering Solomon's prayer in chapter 7. God has not taken the initiative here, but rather Solomon interceding for his people. A good shepherd, if you will. It is Solomon who articulates the shortcomings of the people with all their, with all our sinfulness. All of their and all of our idolatry. And he asked God to hear from his place in the heavenlies and to forgive. I like that prayer from Solomon. Reminding God of God's everlasting love and God's everlasting forgiveness. But rather than calling upon God's answer in 7 and 14 as a nation, perhaps we should read chapter 6 out loud to God as our prayer to God of repentance. All the while seeking His face. If my people who are called by my name will turn, will turn from their wicked ways, will repent, it says. Seeking his face, 
seeking his presence and humbly acknowledging the fact that we have turned away from God in our own ways and have sought after our own gods to worship in one form or another. Often we interpret idolatry as worshiping the cares of this world, but let me share with you idolatry, idolatry is spiritual adultery. It's having a relationship with somebody other than your spouse. We often lay our sin at the feet of materialism and consumerism, but may I suggest that there's a much greater sin here that God is upset about. I believe it comes in the form of control. Listen to me. I'm always puzzled at our need for control. Holding on tightly to everything, including one another. I think control is the aphrodisiac of the insecure. Listen to that. The aphrodisiac of the insecure. In our sense of insecurity, we seek control. We seek to be in charge. And we appoint ourselves the master of our environments, the master of our own destiny. Amen? I once knew a person who exercised her control through passive resistance. She controlled every family gathering simply by being late. Hear this, simply by being late. By being late, by being late to arrive, she maintained a sense of control while everyone else was sitting and waiting for her to show up. That's control at its worst level. Translate the need for uh, control into spiritual terms and it could take the form of prayers more demanding, more petitionary, more presumptuous towards God than repentant. Than repentant. If our prayer life starts out with, oh God, do this and do that and do this and do that. Oh God, I've got the answer to it all if you just listen to me. We're missing the boat. And we're letting the the propensity for us as an insecure people to be in control even with God. 